What's happening, everybody? Jeremy Reddick here. I'm back. If you guys are members of the Success Network or one way or another have been paying attention to the schedule that we have, that I posted, I personally posted with all these classes, all these free classes that everybody could be a part of, um, then you've probably picked up that I've been missing a few. And I have no excuses. I apologize. Uh, life has just gotten a little bit away from me over the last uh, two weeks. Or so, so I want to apologize. Uh, right now, if you're a member of the Claims Adjuster Success Network Facebook group or in one of the other Facebook groups that we're working with, uh, you'll, uh, if you keep your eye on our schedule, I'm going to be jumping in and fixing it up, uh, moving some classes around. What you're basically going to be looking at, I'm going to start doing these, or at least I'm going to do my absolute hardest, uh, best effort to start doing live streams every weekday of the week. That's uh, almost every weekday of the week, Monday, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, I'm going to do these. And uh, the only exception is going to be s Tuesday. And the reason why I won't be doing it on Tuesday is because Tuesdays are our podcast day. Um, I'm going to be participating in a podcast, a regular podcast with uh, two very close friends of mine. Uh, we've already recorded our first episode, so we'll be recording future episodes um, going forward. So make sure that you're following Adjust University's uh, Facebook group. Make sure you're following us on YouTube and you're going to see our first episode once it drops. Now, today's topic is the uh, inspection process, the process of the inspection. Now, this applies to both cat and daily claims. doesn't matter what type of claim it is. It's a process that as an efficient adjuster, you're constantly going to uh, follow. Uh, veteran adjusters, they already know this stuff, but the new adjusters don't know this so much. And having a consistent workflow, a consistent process, every single time that you're in an inspection, it is absolutely necessary because if you if you don't have a process that you're always following it's going to feel like chaos once you're out there you're going to allow the policyholder to dictate the the uh, flow of the claim and it's just it's it's not what you want um so before we get started if you are watching this right now just do me one quick favor you got a free class i'm giving you a free class right now just do me one solid just hit that share button if there's no share button do me a favor jump over to our youtube channel just go on youtube look for adjuster university we are streaming live in our youtube channel right now uh, if you aren't already a subscriber hit subscribe hit the notification bell so you can get push notifications every time i start doing one of these free classes but once you're over there share this to every social network that you're on i would really appreciate it uh, do whatever you can to get that little wherever it's showing up right now that little viewer count as high as possible that's really why i put these uh, events on. So we're going to be going through and uh, I'm going to go through this presentation on the process of an inspection. Like I said, this is mostly for new adjusters, uh, new field adjusters. If you've ju just gotten in or you're waiting on your first appointment, this is your uh, class. This is the class for you. So uh, while I go through this presentation, it's approximately, it's going to be like maybe like 15 minutes long, something like that. At the very end, I'm going to answer any questions that happen to drop in the chat box. Now, I want to let you know ahead of time, I don't see every single question that gets dropped. If you are, if you are viewing this inside of the Claims Adjusters Success Network Facebook page, uh, typically, I do see those comments come through. If you are logging in from our YouTube channel, I will also see those come through as well. If you're watching from any other uh, source, I may not see your questions. So it's important to jump over to YouTube and watch your questions and, and log your questions there or inside of the Claims Adjuster Success Network. If you're not a part of the Claims Adjuster Success Network, um, jump over, apply to become a member. Uh, right now, we do have a small backlog, so you won't be able to jump right in and watch this. That's why it's important to be uh, jump on YouTube because that's instantaneous. So jump over there and check it out. At the very end of this presentation, I'm going to go through, take a look at if there's any questions, and I'll answer any questions that might that that 
um, that may get posted. It doesn't matter if it's related to this or not. If you've got a question, drop it in there. Uh, and I will do my best to get to it at the very end. Um, I am pretty, to my. if you know me, then you know my schedule's crazy. So I'm not, I can't keep this on for very long. So we're going to get this show on the road. Once again, make sure you're following us on YouTube, Facebook, all that sort of jazz. Show your support. Share this as much as possible. And without further ado, I'd like to get this thing rolling. Here we go. So this class, we're going to be talking about the process of the inspection. Now, this is imperative for all field adjusters to understand, even if you don't exactly apply what I go through in this lesson, it is imperative. It is super important. You know, fill in the blank. It, it, it is absolutely necessary that you yourself as a field adjuster have a process that you follow. And it's important that you do this because once you have a process, then the noise that, it, that, that is inherent with handling claims starts to get lowered. Once you get out there, it doesn't matter if you're running day claims um, and, and you're looking at a very simple water loss that's going to be less than the deductible, or you're out doing a Cat 5 hurricane. It doesn't matter. The only difference is how big that estimate's going to be and how long you might be at the loss location. But no matter what, you, uh, Nick Saban, famous coach at uh, University of Alabama, Alabama, he always talks about following the process. He, he doesn't aim to get to the Super uh, He doesn't aim to get uh, a championship every year. He just aims to execute the process, the championship winning process. And that's why he's a legend in the sport. So it's important to have a process down so that no matter what, no matter how big or small the inspection is, no matter how overwhelming that inspection might be and how big that claim might be, all you need to worry about is properly executing your process. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. If you can't execute the process, then you're going to get, it, it, it's, that's when you're going to get overwhelmed. So we follow two primary um, philosophies once you're out in the field. Outside in, top, bottom. Outside in, top, bottom. Those are two of the most important of uh, flows that you're going to need to remember. And although I said at the head of this lesson, uh, it doesn't matter what your process is, just as long as you have a process, I, I do highly recommend that you follow this process because you're starting outside and then you're going inside. You're starting at the top, whether it's outside or inside, and you're ending at the bottom. It is a consistency. It's a, a, so all of your files that you return to have the same consistent flow. And I've never had a problem um, doing inspections just like this. Okay, now why would we have this flow? Why would we follow this inspection and every single inspection that we go, go, go through? Because like I said at the very beginning of this lesson, it, it organizes your inspection. If you're a new adjuster, this could be the most Oh, the actual inspection itself could be the most overwhelming part of your job. You, especially if you're dealing with a large loss, especially if you're out on deployment and you've got a 20, 30, maybe $40,000 loss looking right at you. Once you get out there, once you have this same workflow, then it becomes more of a process that you just have to go through. Okay. Now there's some common disruptions to that. It's not as easy as it always seems, okay? The one biggest disruption that you're going to have is going to be the policyholder. It's going to be the emotionally charged policyholder. Just think, and obviously you're gonna find that more commonly when you're out in a large event or a you know, cat five, cat four, hurricane, something like that. That's gonna be more prevalent, but it's not just those. You'll get, the, you'll get an emotionally charged policyholder on small losses because that might be the biggest thing to happen to them in their home their entire life. And it might be nothing to you, but it might be something big to them. So your common disruption is going to be your policyholder. Now, what does that look like? That looks like once you get to the home, you get there. Hi, my name is Jeremy. Oh, my gosh. 
You have to come in. This is the worst thing that has ever happened. You've probably never seen anything like this. Come look. We have damage over there. Then they take you to the other side of the house. We have damage over there. Then they take you upstairs. We have damage up here. Oh my gosh, I got to show you the basement. Then they take you down. Oh, and then I forgot to tell you the whole way back and then they're taking you over. Okay. Now at that point, you're out of a flow. The flow that you're following is a flow that is uh, uh, directed by the policy holder. Now, there, that being said, we're going to get to that and we're going to get to this a little bit more. You do want to listen to the insured. You do want to understand everything that's there. However, you are not in the position to begin your inspection yet. At that point, you are in what I consider to be your investigative, uh, the, the, the investigative portion of your inspection. Okay. You want to investigate first. That's it. You're not there snagging photos. You're not there doing your, your uh, floor plan on your clipboard. You're not at that point yet. Right now, you're just listening. Okay. Now, that starts, the, the investigative aspect of this starts as soon as you knock, knock on that door. You knock on the door. They answer. Hey, how are you? I'm, I'm Jeremy, the claims adjuster. How are you today? That's it. That's all you need to say. Oh, I'm great, Jeremy. Come on in. Or hi, yes, I, I, I'm good. How can I help you? Okay. You always, obviously, first thing to do is introduce yourself. When I go out to my claims, I am very short, very brief, and I'm getting right to the point. Um, I'm going to listen to the policyholder, uh, any sort of conversation that they want to engage in. I will engage with them. I'm going to, you know, apply some customer service there, but I'm there for a reason. And if we start to veer too far off the purpose of why I'm there, I'm going to start to gently bring us back to where we need to be. So once I get in there, I'm going to introduce myself. Hey, I'm Jeremy. I'm the uh, field adjuster to your claim. How are you doing today? Good, good, good. I I'm, I'm doing well. Great. So what happened? Get right to the point. Tell me what happened. Well, the pipe broke. That's what happened. All right. Well, let's check it out. Now you're going directly where it is. They're going to show you the bathroom. They're going to show you where everything happened. Okay, we got uh, the uh, the toilet overflowed. Water came out everywhere. Company came in. Uh, Serve Pro came in. They tore out the drywall, and and that's that. Okay, is there any other rooms that are affected? Oh yeah, right, right in the bedroom, right next. I'll take you there now. Okay, then we go to the bedroom. They show us the bedroom. Okay, great. Are there any other rooms that are affected? Oh yeah, the the backside of the master bathroom is also affected. Then we go there. The purpose of what I'm doing is I'm mentally getting an understanding of where there is damage. Now, once I start my actual inspection, I'm going to make sure that the damage is limited to those areas, but I want to make sure that I am investigating all of the rooms that are affected per the insured. Now, we've already checked out those rooms. I'll ask about the basement or the first floor. You ask about all these areas because at first you are investigating. You're figuring out what's happening. You're gathering information in your head before you start putting pen to paper. And it's important that you do that. So once you have a full understanding of everything that happened, you know that it was a toilet that overflowed, that it was uh, the, the pipe that broke, that it was the uh, candle that fell over. Once you understand what rooms are affected, then you're prepared to move in to the second phase. And that's the actual execution of it. Now, you have, now, you've already received everything that the policyholder had to tell you. That's good. So you wrote down any notes that you have to wrote, write down, and there's nothing else that the insured needs to get off their chest. And it's important to get to that point, because if you don't get to that point, if you kind of hurry through and the insured has things that they wanted to tell you, that they thought, when that man, when that adjuster gets here, we got to make sure that we tell them this, 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 and that. Okay, they might even go as far as to write down a whole um, a whole list of things that they want to go through. Do yourself a favor. You might have 10, 12, 15 claims booked that day and you're on a tight schedule and you're ready to go. And, and trust me, there is nothing worse than showing up. You're behind on your schedule. You show up and then they have a, a whole legal pad of, of uh, bullet points that they need to go through with you. I understand it's it, it's awful, but you need to go through that because although you might only be making $200 on that claim, $300, whatever the case is, if you don't allow them, 
If you don't allow the policyholder to get everything off their chest and make sure that they know that they've communicated to you everything that was wrong, even as insignificant and meaningless as some of those bullet points might be, if you don't get to that point, then they have a reason to complain. And trust me, if you do anything wrong at that point, they're going to complain. So now's the point where you're ready to execute. You're ready to start putting pen to paper. You're ready to start jotting down, taking your photos and getting this actual inspection on the road. So you're going to start outside. Remember, because we go outside in. And once we're outside, we're going to go top to bottom. Okay. Now, the very first thing you did, hopefully, right as soon as you got out of your vehicle, was take a picture of the home and take a picture of the building, whatever the case. That's your risk photo. Okay. Usually, you want to follow that up with a dress verification photo, just a photo of the uh, number of the home or building that you're at. It's not entirely necessary. Uh, it, it, it improves the quality of your file, but sometimes that number is not there. Who knows if the number is there or if it's not there. Sometimes I, I just skip that altogether, but the risk photo is uh, necessary. You got to have your risk photo. Now, after that, we're going to start outside in, top down, uh, top down. That, of course, you're going to start with the roof. That is the very first part, um, assuming that it's a wind claim or there's a reason for you to be on the roof. Okay, but we start with the roof. So you have your risk photo, then we're going to the roof. Once we've exhausted all the photographs of our roof, then we know we gotta come down to the elevations. Now, there's uh, mostly, I would say, a 95% uh, agreement on what order to take your elevation photos. And those photos will flow in a counterclockwise direction. That means we're gonna start at the front elevation. That is uh, most, Commonly, if you're standing roadside, you got out of your vehicle, you're looking at the front of the house. It is the part of the house that if the house was for sale on Zillow, that's the first photo that's there. It's the face of the house. That's your front elevation. Then you're going to go in a counterclockwise direction to your right elevation, your rear elevation, and your left elevation. Okay. So you always flow with that. Some companies will ask you to go in a, uh, to start with the left. I've had that a few times in my career. Not very often does that happen, but generally you're going to want to go in a counterclockwise. You don't generally need any corner shots, front right elevation, uh, right rear elevation. You don't need that. What you need is your front right rear left. If you're dealing with a big home, split them up into multiple photos. Okay. So as you go through, now generally just a uh, photo capturing etiquette. You always have your overview photos and you always follow that up with a close-up photo. And do your best to avoid any confusion by taking, you know, let's say you have a massive house, okay? Then you take your overview of the front elevation, you just manage to get everything in the frame and then you wanna show a, some damage to a piece of siding. And you get, if this was a siding right here, you get this close to it just to snag a picture. And in the process of doing that, you eliminate any possibility that someone else who is not there with you at that time would know where that piece of damage siding is. So I usually like to take a nice broad overview. Then I know if there's some siding damage up here, up here by the door. I want to take a picture first that shows that door, that shows that window right there. And then if I need to, I'll come in a little closer just so the viewer understands exactly where that damage is. So. Starting on the outside, very first photo is our risk photo. Then we start taking our photos of the roof. Then we start taking our photos of the exterior elevations. Now, I'll go back to the roof for just a moment. So on that roof, you may not have a simple gable roof where it's just the front or and the rear. This one right here, it's kind of drawn out where you have a right slope and a left slope, right? So which slope is the left, which slope is the right? You follow the same philosophy, the, the same um, flow that you would with the exterior elevations. You have the front facing slopes. Those are the slopes that you can see that are facing you when you're in front of the building. Then you have the right facing slopes. When you are taking your right elevation photos, those would be the slopes that are facing you at that moment. Okay. So when you're on the roof, take your photos in that order. Start with your front facing photos. Then you move to your right facing photos. Then you move to your rear and then to your left. Some companies, some adjusters, they have this thing where they want to take uh, uh, overview photos of all the all of the slopes first, and then 
they take photograph close up photographs of the damage over you know wherever those are i hate that and the reason why i hate that is because it's harder for the viewer to understand exactly where there is damage there's nothing better in my opinion and, I, and i'm open to an argument here there's nothing better than if you start on the roof you take a nice overview of the front photo of the front facing slope and then you take that close up of where the damage is on that slope from a viewer's perspective I don't see how that can be confused. I don't see how that can be misinterpreted. Here is the front. Here's a close up of damage. Here is the right. Here's a close up of damage. And it goes on like that. So once we get done with the exterior portion of this, that's when we're going to move to the interior. So in the interior, here's what you need to remember. You want to take your photos in a specific order. One thing that field adjusters hate doing is labeling photos. Everybody hates it, okay? And trust me, there's a good reason why. It, is a, it can be a very time-consuming task. The actual naming and describing of photos is one thing. But what makes it so much worse is when the adjuster needs to reorganize their photos constantly. This is something that can be corrected 99% of the time. And the reason... And, and the method, the way that we can correct that is by making sure our photos are captured in the correct order from the get. Once we're in the home, here, and, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna teach this without even really looking. Once you're in the home, you're gonna be taking your photos first based on the level of, of, of where the damage is. Then you're gonna take it based on the name of the room. So what this means is if you have a home where you have damage to the second floor, first floor, and the basement, where's your first photo gonna be? It's gonna be in the, in the second floor. Then, then after you've exhausted all the second floor photos, that's when you move to the first floor. And once you've exhausted all of that, that's when you're gonna to move to the basement. Now, pop quiz, what if there's damage to the attic? Where is the attic? The attic is above the second floor. So that's your first set of photos. And you would go attic, second floor, first floor, basement. Top down, okay? You're always going to do this, top down. When you go into a home and they show you the damage to the first floor bedroom and the first floor bathroom, and you ask them if there's any damage to the second floor, then they say yes, and they bring you to the second floor, they show you damage. That's where you're gonna start your photo taking, is up there. If they bring you in and they're like, I'd like to first show you the second floor and they bring you to the second floor, they show you all the damage. Is there any other rooms? Is there any other rooms? And they say, okay, yeah, I want to show you the downstairs to show you what happened there. You have a choice right there. You can either stop the insured in their tracks and say, all right, well, let me first get this documented so that we can go top down. And then once I get all this done, once I get my photos taken, once I get my rooms drawn out, well, uh, I'll meet you downstairs and we can get that done. You can absolutely do that. Don't feel weird. You can absolutely do that unless you just want to take it easy that day, walk with them downstairs, check all that, and then say, okay, great. I'm going to get started here. I'm going to be taking photos and measurements, stuff like that. should be like 15 or so minutes. And then you will back upstairs to the second floor and start doing your job. Okay, now let's talk about – now levels is easy. Doing the levels, that's pretty common. Now rooms is where it gets tricky. Now – as simple as I'm gonna make this out to be, there are a lot of adjusters that don't do their rooms the way that I do. Now, no matter what, whenever I'm in a uh, whenever I'm in a home, okay, anybody that's reviewed my files will attest to this. I don't have that many different names of rooms that I do. I review files, I see some crazy name rooms. Uh, some people like to name the room boy, you know, boys room, boys bedroom, girls bedroom. Uh, if, if there is a big living area. OK, I've seen living room, great room, family room, uh, den. Listen, there are hundreds of different names of rooms. Now, it's going to be very hard. I don't care how smart you are, but it's going to be very hard for you to always remember unique names for rooms. The more rooms that you commonly use, it's gonna be harder for you to remember those rooms. So condense it down, do yourself a favor, don't use so many rooms. Have a set, uh, have a certain selection of room names that you go through and that's it. Now I'm gonna tell you mine. This is how crazy I am. I'm gonna list my rooms without even looking at this list, which I think is like 10 or so. 
Once I go into an inspection, they show me all the uh, where all the damage is. Okay. I know that I'm going to take my photos in a certain order. Now, what I don't have on here is uh, the common rule that wherever the first room that you start in should be the origin. Okay, wherever it started from, that's where your first photo should be because it kind of it it paints a picture of what the next uh, damage wise, what the next photo should have. All right, so let's say that you're dealing with a typical water loss. Okay, a, a toilet overflow, toilet overflowed in the bathroom and it flooded the entire first floor. Water everywhere. Okay, so I'm going to start in in the bathroom. Okay, there's two bathrooms on this floor. So my first set of photos are in the bathroom. I'm gonna name that bathroom, bathroom number one. Now after that, I am going to, in my head, I already have a list of, uh, of my room names that I go through. And I'm gonna start thinking um, of each room name uh, a, 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 in relation to what I had already saw, what I saw during the investigative portion of my inspection when the insurer was showing me all the damage. The first room I'm gonna look for is a foyer. All right, any sort of entry room, really. If it's a mud room, that's a foyer, okay? Any area where you walk in, there's no couch, you wouldn't hang out there, but it's a room uh, that you would walk into, that's a foyer. If there's two of them, I'm gonna name it foyer one, foyer slash entry one, and I'll name the second one foyer slash entry two. Now, after that, I'm gonna move to the living room. All right, that's my number two room that I look at. Now, if there's a large living room, some may call it a great room, and then there's a room that's like a living room, but nobody goes in there, there's plastic on the couch, I don't care. It's a living room. Now, the bigger one, I'll call that living room one. The smaller one, I'll call that living room two. They're both living rooms. I don't care. And then that brings me to the dining room. I'm going to check out the dining room. Okay. After the dining room, that brings me to the kitchen. I'll check out the kitchen. Now we start to progress into other rooms. Now, then I'll go to the laundry room. I'll go to the utility room. Okay. And then I'm going to go to the garage. And the way I kind of think of it is like, what rooms would I want to live in the least amount after the kitchen, of course, right? I would live, want to live in the laundry room. And then if I had to, I'd live in the utility room. At least it's warm in there. And then I'll go into the garage. Okay. Now, if there was no utility room, I'm just going from the laundry room to the garage. That's it. Now, after the garage, that's when I'm going to start to move into some different rooms. Okay. Now that brings me to, I'm, I'm keeping my eyes right here. Now it brings me to the hallway. Okay. Now I'm going to take pictures of the hallway. Now, then that brings me to the, an office or a bedroom. And I have a very, now it, it, you could call it a den. You could call it a den. You could call it a, a storage room, whatever the case is. But here's the way that I think of it. If it is a room that does not have a closet, then it's technically shouldn't be considered a bedroom. Now, if that's the room, I'm just going to call it an office. I don't care what's in that room. I don't care if it's a being, you know, I really don't care what's in there that's an office. Now, if there was a closet in there, then I'm going to call it a bedroom. Now, if that room has a closet in there and, I, and there's damage in the closet, I'm going to call that bedroom one, closet one. Okay. Uh, I'm going to put the number one in front of any room where there's multiple of. So if we have a hallway and the hallway has a closet, I'm going to call it hallway and then hallway closet. And then that brings me to the bedroom, uh, master bedroom. Okay. So bedroom one, closet one for the big closet that's in there. And then I'll do bedroom one, closet two for the smaller closet that's in there. And then that's going to bring me to the second bedroom, smaller bedroom. I'm not going to call it girl's room. not going to call it boy's room. I'm not going to call it rear left bedroom. It's bedroom two. Then that brings us to bedroom three, bedroom four, bedroom five, whatever the case is. Then that brings us to bathroom number two. And it's bathroom two because bathroom one was the first one that we started in. We do all of that and then we move on to the basement. Okay, and then we follow the same thing. Now, why would I bother going through the painstaking process of trying to remember all this? That's because later, when I'm doing my photos, I already know what rooms they are. I know I started in the foyer. I know I moved to the living room, then the dining room, then the kitchen, then the laundry room, then the utility room, then the garage, and the hallway, bedroom, the, the, the office, bedroom, bathroom. I know this already, so I don't need to move my photos around. Because before I even took my photos, I made sure that I positioned myself in the correct room to take those photos and to inspect. That's why it's super important. So we've gone through all of that. Then, man, it gets easy. Now, at that point, we finished our interior inspection. Uh, we, at that point, we should have already done our exterior inspection. Now, I, I'll give you a little caveat. Uh, uh, I'll make one exception. 
if I'm dealing with a roof leak, I will go and do the interior first. I'll do the interior first just so I can get a better understanding of where the water's coming in from. And since I'm already in the house, I'll do my, my interior, the interior portion. Okay. That's the, that's the only time I really um, divert from my own process. And it's just, it's a little easier for me at that point. Cause then I know exactly what pipe boots, boots to look at or, you know, stuff like that. All right. But once we get done with that, once we get done checking out um, everything associated with coverage, A, everything associated with the dwelling, that's when we would move to whatever's after coverage A, coverage B. Okay. Now I know uh, coverage B isn't the same everywhere. Um, things, you know, certain states, certain policies, where I'm coming in from, coverage B is going to be your uh, other structures, uh, your your garage, your detached garages, your storage structures and stuff like that. That's when I would move to those areas. Now, if I'm dealing with a, a pool house, a real nice pool house, or maybe a guest house, I'm going to follow that same flow, except now, now I'm moving over to coverage B and I'm going to start on the roof. I'm going to do my exterior elevations. Then I'm going to go inside start at the top and work my way down. The same process, okay? Now, after that, that's when I'm gonna to move to my coverage C, my personal property. That's when now I'm gonna be taking photos of all that, okay? During my inspection, they might even ask, hey, you just moved from the bedroom. You didn't take a picture of the, uh, of the mattress. It's soaking wet. Are you gonna take a picture of that? I am gonna take a picture of that. I'm gonna to get to that later. It's very important. Don't let the policyholder dictate the flow of your inspection. That's one of the most common things that are going to mess you up because they, they want to flood you, you know, for lack of a better term. They're going to flood you with information and they, they think you're, you're just going to absorb all of it and then leave. You need to follow a certain flow. If you follow that flow, your inspection is going to not only be faster, it's going to be more accurate. And the more accurate it is, the, uh, the, the more accurate your inspection is, the more accurate your estimate's going to be, and that's going to be less time that you're going to have to invest later on to make any corrections or anything like that. So that's going to be your flow. Number one, outside in, top down, okay? And it's very important um, to have the names of rooms that you're going to follow, okay? doesn't have to be this one, but listen, I just, I, I just mapped it out for you. I've done thousands and thousands of homes at this point. Sometimes I might find a room that does earn a new name, but it is few and far in between. If that happens, I give it to, uh, uh, I'll throw it in there, but the vast majority, it's going to be a name that's on here. You don't need to complicate things. Just make it simple because the simpler you make it, the simpler your inspections are going to be and the simpler your inspections are going to be, the faster you're going to get out of there and the faster you're going to get out of there, it's going to be the faster you get to close then and the quicker that you're going to get paid. All right. All right, my friends, that's a wrap for this one. All right. If you've got a question, this is your last chance to get it in. All right. Let's see. Okay, we got a, uh, right now I got one question here and I'll, uh, I'll answer this one. If you got a, another question, drop it in. Let me just move this out of the way first. All right, let me see where we're at. All right, Tony, let's drop this in. All right. Coming over, let's see, coming over from YouTube, once again, before I even answer this, if you're not already, subscribe to us on YouTube, all right? Push the notification bell so you know when I'm coming in. So, uh, appreciate you too, man. Uh, newly licensed adjuster in four states, Florida, Georgia, LA, and Texas. Got, the, got those hurricane states trying to make that hurricane money. All right, signed up with about... 10 different uh, rosters, but haven't gotten a call. What do I need to do? All right, Tony, that's the most common question. All right, uh, so you signed up with 10 rosters and you haven't gotten a call. I've said this story a million times. It, it, when I first got started, I did a very similar thing. I started off with five uh, adjuster companies and those, those companies were, you know, at the time it was Whirly, it was Pilot, Crawford, Eberles, and maybe Renfro, right? 
You've probably heard of all five of them. And you probably heard that because they're five of the largest companies that are out there. So I put my application in, you know, I sent them my resume, which was bone dry. There was nothing on there, right? I just sent it in and I sat around because I heard in, you know, whatever event, however, that all you need to do then is just sit and wait. You know, that's part of the game. You, you, you join rosters and then you just hang out waiting for the next event. Okay. It's the worst advice you could possibly receive. Okay. Now you're in a little bit better shape if 10 is an accurate number because you did you, you had twice as much of a chance that I did at that. But there's something to remember here. Now, if you apply to those same companies, those same big ones, okay, the big boys, you're not the only one applying over there. You're applying with everyone else that heard about the largest IA firms that are out there. You're, you're not doing yourself any favors at that point by joining a roster with like everybody while everybody else is, right? So first thing you should think about is you got to get on more rosters, okay? You've, you've probably heard that before. Get on as many rosters as you can. Now, it's true. You should get on as many rosters as you can, but, uh, and, and you're going to get a ton of, uh, you're going to find a ton of adjusters that are going to tell you that same thing, but they're not going to tell you the next part. And, and that it's not just about getting on rosters. That's like step one. There's more steps after that. You still got to market yourself. You still got to sell yourself to those companies. Now, if you just got on the roster, I mean, some of these companies, I mean, that's as simple as going to their website, filling in a little bit of information and then hitting submit. That's it. That's not the million dollar idea. That, that's not the path to success right there. Sure, you might get lucky. You might get a phone call when they have absolutely no other place to go. But, how, but do you really want to rely on a luck and chance to be successful as an IA? You don't want to do that. So it, 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 you're trying to figure, you, you've joined a bunch of, you joined 10 rosters and you're trying to figure out where to go next. Man, you got to join more. All right, we got, I had it up on, on the screen a, se uh, screen a second ago, uh, the Become a Six Figure Adjuster um, package. Okay, there's a ton of stuff in there. All right. A part of that package is we have a list of 500 adjusting companies, 500 adjuster firms to market yourself to. You got you got to start marketing yourself to a large number. Because here's what you got to remember too: you might have marketed yourself, submitted uh, your resume and whatnot to 10 companies. Okay, I don't know if you're trying. You've got all those southern states lined up. I don't know if you're just looking for cat work or if you're willing to do some daily stuff too. But let's say you're looking for daily too. OK, not depending on where you live, some of those 10 companies might not even have any work there. OK, so you're dealing with 10 companies and then these 10 companies might be 10 of the biggest companies in the U.S. Some of them don't even have work in your area. And then the ones that do have work in your area, man, you've got competition with a lot of people that already have experience. Now, just because they have experience doesn't mean that you're not going to get a chance with them, but it means you're going to have to work a little harder to get that chance. It means you're going to have to market yourself a little harder. You're going to have to sell your services a little bit harder than the other people. You got work ahead of you. Now, you should be doing that either way, but your chances get a whole lot better once you start really casting the net out there. I got successful doing this because I play the numbers game. Once I figured out, wait a minute, there's not, there's more than five companies out there. There's literally... At that, you know, I went from, oh man, there, this is like five more companies. And then after that, I was like, wait a minute, I just found 10 more. And then I started to realize, wait a minute, I don't actually know how many companies there are. So then I just started doing research, start digging and digging and digging and digging. And, uh, you know, uh, and then that brings me to where I'm at right now. I've got a list of about 500 companies um, on uh, Justin University. We go there, but it also comes down to, man, even if you're marketing yourself to all 10 of those companies, really depends on how you're marketing yourself. All right. I've said it for years. If you're not finding work as an IA, it comes down to two things. It's two things. You're either not marketing yourself well enough or you're not marketing yourself to enough companies. That's it. You could market yourself in a real shitty way but you're marketing yourself to a lot of companies and eventually that numbers game is gonna benefit you. You could be marketing yourself like an ace. Your resume looks gorgeous, okay? You've got certifications out the ass, but you're not marketing yourself to enough companies. 
The companies you're marketing yourself to just simply don't have work in your area. You need that perfect median. You need a little bit of both. You need a lot of both, really. So you need to make sure that your marketing is right. You need to make sure that you are selling yourself well, and you need to make sure that you are distributing your services across the entire industry, okay? Coca-Cola, Pepsi, all these big name brands, they don't just say, all right, well, let's just market our stuff to the East Coast. No, they're going all over the whole country. They want everybody to drink Coke. They want everybody to wear Levi jeans, okay? Not just certain people. You need to, as a business, you need to conduct yourself the same way. It's not about just, let me just market myself, just these, these little, these couple companies right here. No, you want to get everybody. So then it just comes down to you figuring out who everybody is. You could go to Adjuster University, you could buy the, uh, the becoming a six figure uh, full edition, or you could do it yourself. It's gonna take you more time. If time's valuable, you might just wanna get the package because there's plenty of other stuff in there. It's you trying to do a resume, uh, have a sales and marketing for adjusters course. There's lots of stuff in there, but the link is in this video, go check it out. But if you're strapped and you think you could do it, do it. I mean, I used Google. I used Google, I used LinkedIn, and I used a lot of time. And that's just for the list. And you just got to make sure that your resume is looking good too. All right, guys, that's a wrap here. Uh, so we are done. Once again, if you're just watching this now, watching this on replay, make sure that you are a member of the Claims Adjuster Success Network. I'm going to be jumping on there tonight to update this schedule for everyone. I'm going to be doing much more of these live streams. So make sure you jump on there, check it out. Uh, mark your calendars on anything that's of interest to you. Give me about an hour to put that together. If you're watching this on replay, it's probably already done. And if you're not already, jump over to YouTube where my man Tony came from and like, subscribe, hit the push notification bell. Do whatever you got to do so that you see this mug every time I'm doing something free. All right, guys, it's been a pleasure. I'll catch you on the next one.